Hi there. Dr. Stevens here with the graphical solution of linear programs, or at least the first part of it. This is our chapter three work, and we're going to do it in several pieces because the graphical solution procedure actually has two parts. Part one is finding the feasible region. Part two is finding the optimal solution. There'll be a third part to this series too, where we talk about little weird things that can happen and how you can handle them, and also some shortcuts to make your life a little easier. So we're going to start with a formulation, and then we're going to figure out a way to find its best answer by drawing pictures. So we're dealing with a company that makes and sells patio fireplaces. They've got a pretty good operation going. They, can, they must make and sell at least 60 fireplaces a week because they've got a contract to sell that many. But there's an additional demand for up to 60 more units for a total of 120. If they want to sell more than that, they can hire salespeople. Every salesperson they hire will increase the weekly demand by four more. Then money stuff. Fireplaces sell for $13.25, but cost $3.25 to make, so you're making a profit of $1,000 each. On the other hand, if you want to have salespeople, you've got to pay for them too, $2,500 a week. Then you have to pay for your factory, which costs $36,600 a week, regardless of what you do. And you've got a limited budget. $125,000 is all you're going to be able to spend each week. Fireplaces can be made in a hurry. It only takes 10 minutes to make one because our factory is really quite quick, and it runs for 40 hours a week. Our goal, not surprisingly, is to maximize our profit. All right, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on formulation here because that's chapter two stuff, but you can take a look and see how things are set up. Our goal is to maximize profit, and we've got two limited resource constraints that say that we can't spend more money than we've got, and we can't sell more fireplaces than people want. On the other hand, we have to sell the fireplaces that we contractually uh, we're contractually obligated to, and we can't use more time in the factory than the factory has available. Again, another limited resource constraint there. And then non-negativity. All right. Well, when we put the numbers in these things, it's the same thing as before. Okay. Something like that. I'll let you look over that solution and satisfy yourself that it's correct. And now we want to actually solve this thing graphically. We're going to begin by drawing a pair of coordinate axes, one axis for each of the two variables. This kind of technique will only work on a linear program that has two variables. More than that, and you'd need more dimensions. It can be done, but we're not going to do it. Notice that I've emphasized the first quadrant, where S and F are both positive, but I've drawn some of the other quadrants as well. It's going to be useful to have that uh, extra area available as we draw our pictures. All right. Program. Every constraint has to be drawn. The constraints tell us what's possible, what we can do. The objective is going to tell us what's best among the possible things. So the first five steps of this procedure are going to be figuring out what answers are possible, what combinations of F and S don't break the constraints. The last five steps are going to tell us which is the best of those possible answers. Now, the first thing I'm going to do with these inequality constraints is to replace every one of the inequality symbols by an equal sign. The reason for that is that a linear equality always graphs as a straight line. A linear inequality always graphs as a straight line and everything on one side of that line. Let's get the line first, and we'll worry about which side is the good one later. So let's start with the first constraint. Now all of our constraints are going to be linear constraints, and that means that when we graph them, they will all graph as straight lines. You can figure out a straight line if you can figure out two points on it, so the approach that I'm going to use to graph these lines is what's called the two intercepts approach and it trades on a very simple fact. If you look at all of the points on the vertical axis, the s-axis, you'll find that they all have f equal to zero. If you look at all the points on the f-axis, they all have s equal to zero. So if I want to find out where my line crosses one of the axes, I can simply set the other variable to zero and then solve for the variable that's left. Let's try that. You see the equation at the top of the page. I'm going to replace s with zero leaving an equation that involves only f. Solving for f then will tell me the f-intercept of that line. My particular line crosses the f-axis at 272. Now we'll play the same game with the other axis. We want to find the s-intercept, so we'll set f equal to 0 in the constraint. And when we do so and solve for s, we get that s is 35.36. So the line that I want crosses the s-axis at 35.36, and crosses the f-axis at 272. Those are the two red dots. Connect them with the straight line, and bingo, you've got the line that corresponds to your constraint. Every point on this line spends all the money we've got. 
Of course, we're not required to spend all the money that we've got. Great, but the real constraint didn't require us to spend all the money. It said we had to spend less than or equal to all the money. Well, those points are going to be everything on one side of that line, either the lower left or the upper right. The question is, which one's which? One side spends less money than we've got, one more money than we've got. Well, I'm pretty sure that if you take a guess, you're going to guess right. I'm pretty sure that you guessed that down and to the left were the places where you didn't blow your budget, and up and to the right were the places where you did. And that's true. But it's important that you realize that that's not a general result. Less than or equal to's don't have to point down and to the left. Sometimes they'll point up and to the right. Sometimes they'll point up and to the left or down and to the right. We need a more general, more reliable way to make sure that we show the correct side of the constraint. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to use what's called a test point. Now, you can use any point which is not on your line as a test point, but if it's available, I always use 0, 0. I use it because the coordinates are so easy to use, 0 and 0. It's clearly not on the line, so let's see what we're going to do with it. I'm going to take its coordinates, plug them into the constraint, and see if they work. That will tell me whether or not this point is on the side of the constraint line that satisfies the constraint or the side that breaks it. Very peasy. Stick in 0 and 0 for F and S. And when the smoke clears, the statement says 0 less than or equal to 88,400. Certainly a true statement. So the green cross that you see is on the good side of our constraint line. So this side here is the side that satisfies the constraint. The opposite side breaks the constraint. Okay, let's repeat these, these steps with the next constraint. First of all, replace the inequality with its equality. Next, find the f-intercept by setting s equal to 0, we get 120. Then find the s-intercept by setting f equal to 0, and we get s equals negative 30. That might set off some warning bells for you because you might think, wait a second, we can't have negative 30 salespeople. And you're right. But remember, we're just using these calculations to find the appropriate line. Some points on that line will be possible, others impossible because of other constraints. So let's see. F-intercept of 120, while S-intercept of negative 30 gives us the line that I've indicated there as line number 2. Notice it's got plenty of good points in its upper section. It's just the lower part that's impossible. That won't be a problem for us later. Don't worry about it. I have to find the good side of this constraint, though. Can I use 0, 0 as a test point? So let's give it a try. I'm going to stick in 0, 0. And when we plug in, we'll get 0 less than or equal to 120 plus 0, which is 0 less than or equal to 120. That means that green cross is on the good side of line 2. That's the side we want to include in our picture. Back in high school, maybe you shaded a region that satisfied it. Here we just use an arrow to indicate the good side. So this time, it's going to be that way. Fantastic. Two constraints down. By the way, notice this arrow does not point down and to the left. It points up and to the left, even though it was a less than or equal to constraint. As we said, a less than or equal to can point, have an arrow pointing any way. So can a greater than or equal to. So always use a test point to make sure you've got it right. Okay, two constraints down, two to go. Here's number three, f greater than or equal to 60. First, replace it with this equality, f equals 60. Then play the intercepts game by setting each variable in turn equal to 0. Setting s equal to 0 in this constraint doesn't do anything. There isn't an s, so we just get f equals 60 as the intercept. But setting f equal to 0 gives us something odd. 0 equals 60. When does this happen? Never. So when does this thing cross the s-axis? Never. We'll see that in a moment. Let's play the same game with number 4. Inequality replaced with equality. The f-intercept is found by setting s equal to 0. There isn't an s, so we just solve for f and get 240. But once again, we're getting that if we replace the f with 0, we're told that 0 equals 2400. This is never the case, so this line, too, has no s-intercept. They look like this. Crossing the f-axis at 60 and 2400, I'm sorry, 240, but never crossing the s-axis because of their vertical lines. I have the arrows here on line 1 and line 2. We need to find the good sides of line 3 and line 4. Can we use the uh, test point approach? Of course we can use the test point approach. And we can use 0, 0, because 0, 0 is not on either of the two lines we're testing. So plug 0 in for f and s in the inequalities that, were, that represent those two constraints. 
f greater than or equal to 60 becomes 0 greater than or equal to 60. So arrow 3 should point away from the test point, not toward it. In a similar way, when we try constraint number 4, plugging in 0 for f and s gives us a true statement, 0 less than or equal to 2400, and so arrow 4 points on toward the direction of the yellow arrow, that way. All right. We have two more constraints, though, non-negativity, and they simply force us into the first quadrant. The constraint s equals 0 says that you have to be on the horizontal axis or above. Think of it. s is measuring height above the ground. If you're at a positive height, you're at a, you're at a point above the ground. On the other hand, f is measuring left-right position, so saying that f is greater than or equal to 0 means you have to be on the right-hand side of the picture. That's why it's the yellow arrow, while the red arrow is the s greater than or equal to 0 constraint. It's easy to get these backwards, so make sure you understand this. All right, that's all of our constraints. What we're going to have to do now is to look for a region which is on the good side of every single constraint line, if such a place even exists. I've put a little question mark in the upper left-hand part of the graph. Does that satisfy all of the constraints? Clearly not. Look, you can see that it's on the wrong side of constraint line 1, so let's go ahead and jump across constraint line 1 and try that point. How about this region? Does it satisfy all the constraints? Well, we're satisfying one now, but constraint three is broken. Its arrow points to the right, and we're on the left side of constraint line three. So let's hop again. How about in here? Well, constraint line one looks good. We're up and above constraint line two, to the left of constraint line four, to the right of constraint line three, and we've satisfied both non-negativity constraints. That's our baby. That's what we're looking for. That region right there is called the feasible region. Inside that region, every single constraint will be satisfied. On the border of the region, all the constraints will be satisfied as well. But as soon as you step outside of that blue range, you're breaking at least one constraint. The feasible region may not exist. It may not be possible to satisfy all the constraints. But if it exists, it will be one contiguous area. You won't have two separate feasible regions with space in between them. OK, so let's sum this all up. What have we accomplished? We've managed to identify in our graph a region which is satisfied by every single constraint. As long as you stay inside that region, you don't have to worry about the constraints because you know they're all satisfied. As soon as you step outside that region, you don't have to worry about the constraints either because you know that the solution you're looking at is actually impossible. So basically, after the first five steps, we can joyously throw away the constraints and simply focus on the feasible region, the blue region. Our job is among all those possible points inside the blue region to find the single point which gives us the highest profit. You might be thinking that the further away that you get from the origin, the higher the profit would be. Unfortunately, that's not true. There are some ways to get the answer to that, though, and that next five steps that will complete our procedure and find the best solution is the topic for our next video, Finding the Best Answer.